So, assalamu alaikum and welcome to a very, very special segment of Coping in Quarantine. My name is Iman Ali and I serve as the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. As always, we here at MPAC welcome our viewers watching this live on Facebook, Zoom, or even a recorded version on our YouTube channel at MPAC National. Your support is sincerely appreciated and keeps us here so, so motivated in bringing you the latest updates, initiatives, and projects that impact our community. But today, I'd like to take a moment and ponder on what this phrase means, our community. For many of us, we think of our siblings, parents, neighbors. In fact, for far too many, the reality of some of the most horrendous experiences in this nation have not been a problem in our community. But today, I challenge each of you watching to take an empathetic approach. We are hearing of protests in a variety of cities speaking against racism, bigotry, and police brutality. We are seeing the filmed deaths of men like George Floyd and Amhath Arbery and hearing of the gruesome murders of women like Breonna Taylor. We are seeing a greater push for justice and human security. But ask yourself, what are you doing to help? Justice is not just an issue for those who have been wrongfully killed. It is the issue of our human community. It may not have been your sibling, your parent, your neighbor, but it was someone's. And one day it could be yours if these issues are not confronted as a collective. As always, please make sure to type your questions into the Zoom question and answer portion or, our Facebook, or for our Facebook Live watchers um, in, in the comment section as we will be asking Marguerite uh, many of your questions. Um, and with that, it is my deepest honor to present Marguerite Hill from Muslim Arc to speak with us about what is going on um, in the Black Lives Matter movement and how each of us has a duty to get involved and how we must work with organizations like hers in shifting the narrative change. So with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to Marguerite and Salam to get the conversation started. Thank you, Iman. And, and Marguerite, thank you for uh, not just... Uh, being with us today, because I know you have a demanding schedule, but um, I think your your years and years uh, of work uh, and struggle, when the when the camera was not on this issue, uh, when it was being hidden before our very eyes, um, you continue to to fight the fight, and uh, we're just very proud to have you um, with us, and 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 we we know that we have fallen short. And, and I wanted to have you give us an assessment uh, of, of where we are as a community, uh, as a society, um, as advocacy groups in, in trying to change policy. Uh, I remember back in 1992, it's as if we're having the same conversation uh, uh, after Rodney King and not much has changed. And in many ways, you know, many of these issues have gotten worse. Um, but you have given us hope and I think as the Quran says in Surah Yusuf, only those who deny the truth uh, lose hope. Um, and, and therefore, as believers uh, in God and as followers of Islam, it is our responsibility to maintain hope, but it cannot be an empty sense of hope. It has to be real work uh, that, that shows us a, a path towards um, some kind of uh, resolution or uh, bending that arc of justice uh, in the words of Martin Luther King. And, um, uh, the, the, you know, I, I also find it interesting, you know, we, we find even the NFL is saying, okay, we were wrong about uh, 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 Colin Kaepernick and, and there is a problem. And so many uh, other establishment types, if you will, are, are speaking out, which is, you know, a rarity uh, in, in, in my mind. And, and I want you to to speak about these topics, but I'm going to let you have the floor and um, and say what you what's on, what's in your uh, what's on your heart and on your mind. And again, we're really proud and thankful to have you with us today. Thank you, thank you so much, Salam, for for opening this space to to have this conversation. Um, and I hope that I do do it justice because I'm I'm one person um, who has. Um, greatly benefited and learned from um, the organizers who have been really at the forefront, who've taken a huge brunt 
um, people like uh, Molina Abdullah, um, people like Kenyatta Bakir, um, Patrice Cullors, you know, like all the Black, the uh, founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and, you know, I mean, when we first started Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, um, you know, and I brought my own history in, into this work, right? You know, I mean, and for a lot of people, they may have heard heard my own story and my own narrative, but, um, you know, and one of the, the things about my own history is when, when I was in sixth grade, so it had to be either between like either 1989 um, and my, my family is originally from both like my father's family's from Ohio and my mother's family is from Trent, New Jersey. So they're part of the Rust Belt, right? And, and my um, uncle in the late eighties, he was killed by police in, in the shootout. And, and the narrative around it was definitely um, was deeply troubling, you know, so for one, I mean, my, when my mother went to, um, you know, that was actually the first time I heard my mother cry. Like my mother was like, always like, she did a lot of self-care as a single mother, trying to hold things down as a working class woman out here in California by herself with, with two children. And, um, when she broke down, when my uncle was killed, and when my aunt had called my mother and told her that the police said that they were going to take out my uncle. So it was like, that was like, they were tired of him being this troublemaker, like he had, you know, in and out and everything. So I was aware of that. Right. And so then when 92, when, with the Rodney King and, and I was in high school at the time and, and in my honors classes, I was one of, and even though we were in an inner city school, like in East San Jose, my, most of my classmates were not black. And, and that's when I, you know, like I saw people make a lot of, like my classmates make a lot of excuses for um, that horrific beating that we saw. And so like, that was like the kind of beginning of this era of like, you know, where I knew with my uncle, there was no videotape for my uncle. Um, and I also had to deal with, you know, like my mother going to the police station, you know, the, the conflict, consistent harassment of my brother um, by the Santa Clara Police Department. Um, you know, even living, you know, like we had left the Rust Belt, we left Trenton for more safety in the suburbs, but my brother was not safe, right? From, from over-policing as a black man in, or young black man um, being pulled over. So like the, kind, like the constant profiling. So he was definitely profiled, but also harassed on different levels by, by the Santa Clara and then even, and now, you know, like San Jose police department. Um, so that was like the, the context that just like many other black Muslims that we, we are in that our Islam does not remove that. Like me, you know, Renisha McBride, I had a very similar encounter in Florida driving. I got a flat tire and the police came by not to help me as a single person, single woman in this car, but I was a suspicious vehicle. So being suspicious, being pointed out, being um, having, being interrogated by, by police was something that I was also um, not immune to as, as a woman. And, you know, and then that also extended to like, as being, um, you know, being Muslim, the type of, um, then it was like another layer of, surveillance um, that I experienced and people that I love experience um, having, um, you know, just like a police response, you know, guns pulled on people that I loved. And if they made the wrong move, any wrong move at that time, that they could have also had their life cut short. So that was, that's a stark reality for 25% for of American Muslims. And so when we would see, you know, through, um, you know, with um, Trayvon Martin, there was like, I, I remember when the, when that occurred and, and, and there was like, just definitely a silence in it and it was seen as not a Muslim issue. Being in crisis responses, right? Like where, um, you know, like we've had crisis responses around a number of issues. Um, and some of those may be like, what is the Muslim response to that? Whether we're raising funds for that. So I was involved in and starting to rebuild with love when when black churches there was arson fires and you know like and um 
but like what are things that we would mobilize as a community and so say you know for if a community as a muslim community if someone even if they weren't muslim but were were harmed right like we would mobilize and maybe issue statements across the country and so um philando castile and alton sterling when they were um when they were gunned down and that was also videotaped you know like it was just it was there it was very clear and um you know and i remember umar hakim like calling me he was like what is what are muslims going to do and i was told that's not a muslim issue mm. no one knew how to like make the connections right and um you know but then we had other cases where um there were muslim issues with law enforcement so you know Lukman Abdullah who was under you know he was killed he's the only imam in this country who's been gunned down by law enforcement and he's a black Muslim but yet there was no national outcry the main people that were really working towards that case were um like Dawood Walid and CARE so the CARE Michigan um and um you know and then MANA right and so but like as far as like the national like we have to do something like this case this something wrong with this we need to have a full investigation there was no call in 2000 you know like i think it was at 2008 when he was gunned down and so we have this memory right like black muslims we remember like as far as how many many like years have if a if a black muslim has been gunned down by law enforcement similarly usama rahim was there a national response to that? Any accusation, like if it's good Muslim, bad Muslim, like there was, you know, it was very difficult to drum up support for a full investigation of why he was gunned down and he was out of Boston. Um, you know, there that, um, and I, I don't think it was until we had um, Stefan Clark where um, when they realized that he, like the family called and asked for Janaza. And they realized like he, he was so shot up, they couldn't give him a proper washing, you know, and all because he had a cell phone. And so, you know, yes, you know, like once we had like somebody of the stature of Omar Suleiman coming out and speaking, you know, there was this kind of awareness building. But I could say that, you know, since 2014, when, um, when Mike Brown, you know, like I, I wrote the article about Eric Garner and I shared my own family history and I said, you know, it's not enough that we're silent as Muslims. Um, and that didn't have that much traction. And then when Mike Brown, you know, a few days after I had noticed that clergy across the country had issued a statement and recommendations for our country with um, in, about Ferguson and I saw that there was an absence. And so I began to write some articles and then we, we started to work with other groups to, to do this, a sign in letter to say, hey, when something like our community needs to stand for justice, it's not just when it's one of our own, not just because that they're Muslim, but we stand in solidarity. And, and there was still, you know, like we did get some sign on, but it, it's something de definitely different about this moment um, and given the many cases. And so some of that, like it is definitely a, like it's a welcome thing. Like people like, thank you, Alhamdulillah. Like there's now an awareness of this as a national issue, but it would take the whole country being pretty much burning right now for us as a community to, to, to to say we must do something, right? Because Muslim Ark, I know like, and, and our partners. So, um, you know, people that have been in, you know, on the ground, so there was like Muslims for Ferguson and as like in every city, every time like there was like a case, um, you know, like we would, you know, you'd have like some issue statements, some condemnations, but then sometimes there's like, there's not a sense of like, there wasn't a sense of like, this is an urgency and given our our commitment to justice as Muslims, I really had a hard time um, drumming up like real sustained support, you know, was behind like the letters, like be beyond, you know, and really understanding and being people being able to say like one Black Lives Matter, 
and I'm going to really support the groundbreaking work that they're doing. And as a historian, I, I think it's important for us to really understand like the factors that brought us here to raise, you know, raised awareness. So with Michelle Mar uh, Michelle Alexander's work, you know, on the new Jim Crow, like we we can't just put these shootings within, you know, in isolation of a deeply troubling system. And I'm, I hope that, you know, for whatever, you know, time that I have here, that as we, we really think about our own commitment towards, towards this issue that we really get at the root and the cause. And that when we, as we think about allyship, like what is our individual accountability to that kind of that deep work that's going to make our like ref as we co-create and rebuild our society during this age of corona like the covid crisis is like so you know it's impacting everything um but we have this this unique moment to really do a lot of our own deep assessment right as individuals as far as like why were we complacent so long? And I'm asking myself this as an anti-racism organizer, as somebody that I'm, I've been, you know, like we've been so tired and, and, and beating the drum, but I'm still like, why was I complacent? And if I'm asking myself that question, if people are trying to join me, right, in this work, I am asking everybody to join me to, to do that assessment. What are the narratives that we've adopted, internalized, in our own trying to survive white supremacy. And just remember, like, I mean, I, I like the thing, so I, know, I, I may go to a number of points, but it was not until last year that most Muslim organizations felt comfortable calling out white supremacy. Look at their statements. Look at the amount of time, like, I've had people argue with me and say, we don't wanna name that because we don't wanna hurt white people's feelings. And it's like this country was founded on white supremacy and we have to name that. And what did that look like? What were the institutions that upheld that? And a lot of those institutions were on the criminalization and brutalization and murder of black people. And so the, the fact that we couldn't name a thing, right? Spoke to like that actually just gave us you know, that, that prevented us from really addressing it. And why is it that we couldn't name that thing? Um, it's because like this, you know, we have people that were afraid of hurting their feelings, even though they benefit from white supremacy through privilege or benefiting from the institutions that harm black, indigenous, and people of color around the world. So I think that's like, that's like the one thing, like, you know, just look at our statements, look at our historic discomfort without naming what that is. And then also, you know, we have to do that assessment and looking at when we've been trying to do this work, have we tried to, have we centered white supremacy in our work? Have we centered whiteness and white sensibilities as Muslims? Have we, has our main aim of our own comfort as a community. And, and we have to also acknowledge that there's two different approaches. Like I would say that, um, you know, we also have to think about like, what is, like, why did some people embrace Islam, right? And so within the African American tradition, so 20% of American Muslims are African American, right? And many of us come from a tradition of rejecting white supremacy and um, creating, you know, like whether it's like from the nation of Islam. And these are things that we kind of, many Sunni Muslims feel uncomfortable talking about is like black resistance, black autonomy. So it's like, but these were, when we think about the nation of Islam or those who even embraced whether it's Sunni Islam or the Ahmadiyya group, like how do we as Muslims come to terms with that tradition of both resistance and resilience against white supremacy. And so, you know, and then there's, there's another strain, right, of how we've approached Islam. And, and I think it's important for us to think about our own kind of history and our own 
troubled relationship, right, with with our own narratives as we as we um, try to integrate and assimilate and deal with our neighbors. And and has our work been about forming multiracial coalitions that are natural to us, that includes white allies, progressive white allies, or has our work really been about appeasement of you know, of whiteness and white sensibility. So that self-assessment, that's gonna be some hard work. It includes myself as someone who has gone through institutions like predominantly white institutions. As, as a black woman, like I have to think about my own internalized white supremacy. And for me to do this work, I have to do that every day and interrogate that. And anybody that wants to be committed to anti-racism and the systems change, you have to do this work because otherwise we're just going to keep making missteps and appropriating language and movement work without doing like, you know, and we're going to harm ourselves in it and betray like the, even the principles that we're trying to espouse. So that self-awareness, which is hard, you know, but it also could be like, let's look at our strengths. Let's look at the ways that we've come together, like as Muslim Americans, right? Like who we are, like as the most racially diverse faith community you know, and that because we face Islamophobia, it kind of gives us a lot of co much more cohesiveness than like even like neighborhoods, geographical locales. And we have like a great amount of potential, right, to do this work. And that in many of us, we haven't, we're not, um, you know, like we, with, our, with our traditions of standing for justice, we still have been committed. Like we've been able to like move on things in a faster rate. And I do think within the Muslim community, if we assess where we're at in these kind of conversations across race, we're in a much more, you know, like we're, we're in a better space, right? And then we also have certain things like our own anti-racist ethos, right, of our own tradition, whether we go to the, to the final sermon, right, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you know, a white is not better than a black. You know, we have, you know, we have the narratives of the early Sahabi. We have a diverse global ummah, right? Like how people have come together. Um, we have, you know, tremendous examples in history, right? That we, we could draw on for our own resilience. But it's like also like deeply rooted in our tradition is this appreciation of our languages and our colors and you know and getting to know one another so these like these are all verses like i've not seen anything like this in other faith traditions which is one of the reasons why like i know for me like not just a matter of why i became muslim but every one of us right are choosing to become muslim you know like we wake up and it's like we have to think about our shahada like how we're going to live this life and and that's what you know really inspires me every day to be Muslim because of what it means in this world to have a multi-ethnic ummah that can stand for justice. So, you know, this, this self-work, and I'm, and I'm gonna kind of walk through some of the competencies, right, that, that are part of what Muslim art calls the anti-racism competencies, which draws from very clearly, like, and, you know, anyone that's like a social worker, if you're in social work or your education and you've done cultural competency, there's four competencies. Before, you, you, before, before you go mm -hmm. to that, can I, can I pause and I want you to reflect a little more on mm -hmm. one of your previous statements about you know, the greatness of our religion. Yeah. You know, where, where the Quran says justice is next to piety. Where yeah. The Quran says you've been created from a single pair into different nations and tribes so that you may come to know one another and the best of you are those who are uh, conscious of God. Mm -hmm. and, and the prophet said, uh, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Mm -hmm. You read that and you go, what a wonderful religion. And many people who converted to Islam, like yourself, you know, who come to me and said, I read the Quran and I read about the prophet and I love this religion. Yet when I go to the mosque, I don't find that spirit. In fact, I find the opposite. Uh, walk us through that mm -hmm. uh, as a person. You know, if you've experienced that, uh, and 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 make us more aware of what we are doing. If if nothing else, the whole erasure of uh, of uh, 
of, of, of acknowledging that uh, reality of a multi-ethnic ummah. And then lastly, those who don't want to call white supremacy white supremacy are proof that there is white supremacy. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that, that, that is, I think, is, is the most potent argument against them. But if you could walk us through this idea that we, we have this great religion, here are the ideals, this is what brings people to the faith, yet when they go and meet Muslims, we're, we fall so short from, from these great ideals that Islam is a religion that has no racial imagery. We're, we're not supposed to, we're supposed to be less prone to racism than anyone else. And the question is, yeah. are we really? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, as far as like, so we can talk about like, how does racism show up within, in our Muslim communities, in these microcosms in, in our, in our, in the American Muslim Ummah, then we could talk about what does this look like globally? Because there's like global implications, things that happen, right? Like where we could see um, the ways that like Muslim countries deal with issues, deal with minorities, deal with things. And so, so I'll talk, you know, I could go a little bit into that and then like, yeah, the, and I could go into the competencies because that's like, that's the nuts and bolts of like, how are we going to work through this? But yeah, I mean, when, um, so I first took my Shahada at Masjid Warthin in um, Oakland, you know, and, and the first Muslims I knew were African American. And then I went to college, right? Like, so I was, you know, even before I knew like the MSA, um, I went to De Anza College and I, and I, my, the first people that I, that taught me how to do wudu were two Filipino uh, American Muslim sisters, right? And like, and, and you could, you know, and then I started to have these encounters where, where we were all young and we all didn't have the cultural competencies, but it was like starting to hear some racist jokes, um, you know, and, and it was like, that's not funny, you know, like, and it's just like, and then I'm, I, you know, as an individual, when you call out a racist joke and people say like, okay, like I'm just telling a joke and the defensiveness of that. And then growing, you know, like in, in that, in that, um, like who, who is valued as a convert, right? So, um, and I've heard, and I know from my individual experience, you know, and then as I talk to other black converts in, in, um, in, their, in the area that I grew up in, it was like, you know, most of the black, especially black women converts, it was just kind of like, huh, you know, thanks, mashallah, you know, like, but there was like a lineup of people, like if a, if a white person converted, it was like, the meaning, the, the deepness, like there were like the, I mean, you could just hear some of the statements. It's like, you know, like, wow, you had everything to lose by becoming, you know, like as a white person becoming Muslim, you know, and the esteem that, that many of them got um, early on. And so when I asked about that, then I faced microaggressions. It was like, no, that's, that's you. It's, it's their personality. It was something wrong with my personality that made it while I was not as an attract, you know, like not attra like as a desirable, attractive, friendly, like as a convert that people wanted to get to know. And it wasn't until like I had a, I had got an admission into Stanford University that I became a desirable Muslim convert mm -hmm. to be part of the community and speak on anything. So I had to get affirmation, right, from like one of the whitest neoliberal institutions to have some esteem. And so people like, this is Margie, welcome there to the house. She, she went to Stanford, mm -hmm. um, you know? So, and then otherwise it was like, I would go to new communities and be clearly like a new person and be ignored. And then same person come in like a white person right at the same time and have a swarm of people surround a white convert and ask them all sorts of questions about why did they convert and what was their name and what was you know I was and I was just like I'm just gonna sit here and see and smile you know until like I just got to the point where I didn't want to be that model minority black Muslim um, in that space and I still at times I could go to places where you know I'm not a household name but you know like it's like where people won't know who I am and it's not until somebody maybe does the introduction, but it's like, there are, there's a version sometimes, you know, like to um, welcoming Black Muslims in those spaces. And so, um, and I've experienced that, and I've experienced the comments, 
um, people sharing negative views about Black Muslims. I've been called, you know, and this is like just my own individual story. I mean, I've been called racial slurs in different languages and, and I like, I've learned Arabic. So like there was times where my, you know, like I've experienced even my own students refer to me with the slur when I brought that up, it was not seen as, you know, there was like pushback, which, you know, these, those experiences within Islamic schools and within Muslim environments really inspired my work to like found Muslim Mark because like I knew like I chose Islam. I chose this faith and I chose the faith after reading about Malcolm X, right? So like I knew that there's like multiple traditions and experiences and, um, you know, and, and for me, rat, like I knew as an educator that we have these spaces where Muslim children, black Muslim children have to interact in, in diverse environments and they're subjected to the jokes that I faced when I was 18, 19 years old, but these are teens and this is in their formation of their faith. And given the onslaught of Islamophobia, right? Given the kind of thing that our mosque should be safe spaces and that there was like, these aren't safe spaces for black Muslim youth, right? Like when they go to the mosque and they face racism. And so, you know, that's what made me commit to, to doing Muslim art. The third thing I think like as, as I was in college, given that experience, right, that I had as a young woman or as a, as a girl whose family faced trauma of police brutality, mm -hmm. that police brutality against black people was like certain black issues. The community that I was in did not center that as an issue. And that I felt very alone in, on those issues. And it really made me feel very alienated. At the same time, you would have Muslims that would, my Muslim friends would berate me if I went to the Black Student Union. And so that's why we had the Black and MSA hashtag, because mm -hmm. there's certain things like when, you know, Black students are, were marching for Black Lives Matter, you would have Muslim students in the college MSAs dismiss those things and blame the victims of horrific police violence. And so that alienated many, many black Muslims, or even if they're like, let's have an event. And that was like, no, we're not going to do that. Cause that's not a Muslim. So they would create these dichotomies. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things that many black Muslims experience on day to day, whether it's not being invited to people's homes, and you would see, you know, somebody that's your friend and then they have their own circles. Look at the weddings in Southern California. You know, I've seen people's weddings pictures and I'm just like, hey, like it was a very diverse area, but it looks like they're all in their ethnic groups or they're, you know, open houses for aid, you know, like who gets invited? So they go to maybe an integrated masjid, everything else that happens personally, their iftars, their aid things, are all separate. And if we're not in deep conversation, right? If we're not, if you're not getting to know me as an individual, then some of the stories or the struggles that both black Muslims in general, like, and black Muslims are deeply integrated, right? Like we come from multi-faith families, pretty much, even if you have like three generation of Muslims, we still have multi-faith and mostly most multiracial. Most black families are, you know, are in, like somebody marries, intermarries. So it's like, we're deeply connected, right? But it's like, but if, if we can't have meaningful relationships, yeah, then it's like, you're not gonna really even know like about this world. I've had people from Southern California be surprised at the amount like that black Muslims are 20% of the community, you know, or even, you know, like if I go to the store and somebody asks me, you know, like I've met Muslims, I went to like, you know, if I, I've been to several, like whether bookstores or, you know, regular stores and somebody's like, Assalamualaikum, you know, they're Muslim, they see me because it's obviously this and they ask me where I'm from. And I tell them, you know, like I grew up in Northern California and they're like, no, no, where are you from? My family's from New Jersey, you know, like who grew up in Trenton. And they're like, no, no, where are you from? And I'm like, slavery, you know, like, it's just kind of like, you know, it's just kind of like, what do you say? Like my family was, they came here since the time of, you know, like they were forcibly migrated someplace in Africa, obviously, you know, but 
but the fact that they don't know that that exists. And so there's a deep lack of knowledge around what does the American Muslim, like the Ummah looks like. And, and, and that also speaks to like, you know, just the importance, like how, like whether you're a newer immigrant or you grew up here in an isolated suburb, it behooves you to understand the community that you're in, but that lack of knowledge is also like kind of perpetuates itself. So um, I would say that within, within the American community, Muslim community, um, when I first started doing, doing this work, I used to think it was just me because I was one of the few African-American um, sisters that were out there and, you know, in, in there, there's like a lot of people moved away because of just the gentrification in the Bay Area. But um, when we started to like, when we did the first hashtag being black and Muslim, and it was just like, it was eye opening, like how widespread the heartache and the pain and the, and the dis forms acts of discrimination. And we did face a lot of fragility, right? Like as, as, as people shared, they're being upset, you know, they're like, oh, this is divisive. And it's like, look, we, you know, we had the open prompt and people shared what was in their hearts, like their pride in being black and Muslim, um, their ethnicity. We had Muslims, like we had African-American, we had Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latino, uh, Somali, all the like all the nations in Africa, like they were just like all representative. They like who identified as black, like individuals who identified as black, black Moroccans, Nubians. Like it was just like you know, Ghanaian, Nigerian, Senegalese. I'm totally like, and you know, like if I forgot your kind, like sorry, but like you know, all the countries matter, right? Um, so you know, like that was really beautiful. It was global. But that heartbreak, right, was like, that was something that just stuck to us. And we first thought we were just going to do an initiative. Honestly, Salam, like, we did not think that Muslim Ark would be like an organization. We're just like, we're going to do this initiative. We're going to launch these four campaigns. It's going to be Being Black and Muslim. Then we're going to do Ummah Anti-Blackness. Then we're going to do Drop the A Word to Stop the Slurs. Then we're going to do Black Muslim Futures. And we thought that was it. But how widespread the heartbreak was and how ridiculous some of the comments were, we knew we had to start an education organization. And that's where, you know, Namir and I, like we really had to like keep pushing it past that February until by, you know, by the end of the year, by 2015, we had officially incorporated as a human rights education organization to build capacity within Muslim communities for racial justice. Now, during that time, right, during that time from February 2014, you know, to that 2015, when Eric Garner was murdered, when Mike Brown was murdered, we had to make that shift to not just my hurt feelings of going to the masjid or what we thought were happening inside our community, but what we found was like certain things that were also violent that towards black Muslims in general, but also that we saw prejudice perpetuated against black people within the Muslim community where like, okay, I'm an okay Muslim because I'm Muslim. I mean, I'm an okay black person because I'm Muslim, right? But yet a lack of understanding around these systemic issues that impacted me deeply as a black person no matter what my education was, no matter how much I, I, you know, I gain, I still am still subject to systemic, like systemic racism. And that includes health outcomes, right? Like where, and I was like, alhamdulillah, I had some of the best doctors when I gave birth to my daughter, but still like you had like Serena Williams, you know, who is the wealthiest black, one of the wealthiest black women period. And the fact that she almost died after giving birth. Right, you know, and, and the fact that we have over levels of like policing and surveillance and like, I'm really still afraid, like, I'm like, I gotta get my FOIA because like the amount of surveillance and the amount of things where we've, we've had encounters with law enforcement, you know, is like, was deep. But going back to like Eric Garner and Mike Brown, what we found was that it was imperative upon us to start to educate the broader Muslim community and even black Muslims who may have internalized 
white supremacy, right, to understand the systemic issues. So that we didn't make these cultural arguments blaming young black men and women for being killed by police, given that black people have died, a little black girl died sleeping on a couch during a raid, you know, whether you get in an accident and you knock on the door and ask for help and get killed, you know, like by someone, the vigilantism that we face and like how that's often let, you know, people are let off. So that's what we saw with Ahmaud Arbery. Now what's striking is, is that given all of this movement work, all of the hashtags, it would take from February until May before people saw his murder. They had to see a snuff film to become enraged, right? Similarly with George Floyd, that we had to see a snuff, people had to see a snuff film to get enraged and not just take it like these are, we know that this to be true yeah. and we're going to stand up and we're going to demand to investigate. We're going to demand that, that there's, you know, that officers are charged and then fully investigation whenever, even if somebody's shot, you know, like I know people like their spouses have been, there's a raid, police came in, there's a sister, she like her husband, uh, um, and I'm blanking on his name, he sells like the best water ice in Philly. And he faced like he, they raided his house, shot him up and it's like, oops, my bad. And he has to see the cop that shot him. That is just like, there's no repercussions. Like, oops, my bad, I shot you. So these are the kind of stories, like the trauma that, that we face. And we knew that we had to do something to provide education on the systemic issues and not just the kind of, let's go into the deep traditions of Islam, but like, let's really start to break down the systems that are impacting, impacting um, Black, Latino, Indigenous communities. We also started to work on reformulating how we're approaching Islamophobia, right? As a, as a, from a systems change approach and understanding that this is like all rooted in white supremacy. And, and this is how we have to fight it from, from, from a multi-pronged approach through solidarity, but also naming the systems and who benefits from the systems. So obviously, Police brutality, mass incarceration have been key in Muslim Mark's work. Um, and, and it wasn't, you know, and we, we did come about during, during a, a specific time, you know, we didn't think we were gonna go into that work, but like the black, movement for black lives started, you know, like really widespread 2014 with that hashtag and, you know, since then, we've been definitely, you know, we've been involved in trying to create resources to give Muslims the, the language to talk about that. We, you know, like when we did our uh, Make It Plain um, March, like protest in March in Philadelphia. So I was on the back end remote organizing that with Muslim Wellness Foundation um, and a coalition out of Philadelphia. And we had people who were like, you, it's, it's haram to protest in Islam. Mm. You know, some people blame, you know, blame single mothers for these young men killed, you know. So this is coming out of the Muslim community, even mm. my own Black Muslim community. Like, th these are things we have to kind of contend with and yeah. the debates that we're having. And a lot of us don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. And I would just be very honest and transparent, like even for myself, as I was doing this work, I was learning on the job, but I had to step into that work and make those mistakes publicly. And so, you know, and this is why, like, you know, why I think that it's, it's just absolutely important that we, we step into this knowing that it's, yeah, we're going to make mistakes as we seek solidarity with those who are deeply impacted by the system, you know, we, as we, we, we have to think about who we've harmed, right? Like I know like there's people that I've, I've done things. I've called the police on people. Like I've had a home invasion and maybe we could have, you know, like, and I think back to that moment and I remember getting a call, you know, like, so after all this thing of having this home invasion, a home invasion, you know, like, and I've had like three home invasions and most of them have been a non-black Latino, like, and so, um, you know, what is my complicity in that? And could we have let that young man go, 
rather than call the cops. I mean, it was like, and now I think about it and I'm like, yeah, we should have, if, if, if I was there in that space, like, I would just be like, you just need to go, you know, like after, I mean, you find out my mom, like my mom is really good. Like she's a great, like she actually had held him. Like she's five, two and she's really <laughs> tiny, but she's like, so really good at like, she, you know, like, I don't know, like, whether it's, like, she's a good fighter, like, she could, like, because we were scared, like, here's, like, here's this young man right. that snuck into our house, and you know, my mom held him until the police came, and then it was just, like, this whole thing, but I'm, I'm rethinking my own relationship with police. When do I need to call? Right. Do I need to call things, you know, like, and so, um, well, that, and that's the shame of it, is to, mm-hmm. to make a choice between, and, you know, at that moment, I'm sure you're thinking about you know, your own life mm-hmm. and je- jeopardy and then having the fear of calling the police. And, and I think that is one of the issues is we need to be free from that fear. Yeah, because when we had the other types of conflict that we've had, there was another time we had a break in. And so like my mother held, you know, like held the, and the, and the, and the cops threatened to arrest my mother. Yeah. You know, like this little black woman who's just trying to be like, I'm trying to stop somebody that's trying to get into my house. Um, Similarly, there was another conflict where I was assaulted and like they went to arrest my brother. My brother didn't uh, assault me. It was a white person in our house that assaulted me when I was when I was a youth. So it's like, you know, these are things it's it's scary to call the cop. And many black people don't call the cop, whether it's like from like hate crimes anything so there's an under reporting of that and i think that when people really you know you have like for for muslims who don't have that relationship with law enforcement and have faced like the criminal like being criminalized in that way or being vulnerable in that way they may they may have not um you know like they may not understand like the need for the call for radical solutions the radical ways of like how we think about police and how we have to call law enforcement into account um, and the very systems that that help perpetuate and keep, um, you know, like racist cops on the force, you know? And it's not just about individuals and it's not just about, you know, like, and I, I just have to say, it's like, it's not just about bad apples right you know you have unions you have a culture of silence right you have you have things that are in place that just make it very hard to like charge and you know and then they could have something bad happen and they move to another force and you know so there's there's a lot of things that we have to rethink and for me as an anti-racism educator that you know that's not necessarily my area of expertise but i'm leaning heavily into the people that are getting wins to make us safer, you know? And that's why like, we have to follow the lead of Black Lives Matter. And not just some when it's convenient, you know, like sometimes we find uh, some people where it's convenient or we may think like, that's too radical. We may undermine that, um, that solution, but it's really important like for us as Muslims, when we're looking at the history of policing in these communities, when we're looking even at the history of policing and the amount of money that goes into into war into policing you know like right. trying to control into jails right we have to really think about do we need that type of investment or what would what it would look like if we sent that same amount of money into education into jobs into you know healing programs that's right if we had that like Los Angeles itself, DC, all the cities across it would, would be better. So when you're hearing those calls, defund the police, and a lot of us who, you know, like our mosques have been subject to like hate crimes. And so like, you know, we feel like, yeah, they got our bet. Like, so there's some mosques where, you know, we honestly have a decent relationship with law enforcement and, and, you know, and, you know, and then in that relationship, there's like the buttering up you know, that we've done, which is, you know, which has left people out there who've been working for this reform feeling betrayed in many ways, feeling undermined. And so 
it's going to be some tough conversations for those who are like tired in the field and for those who are like we're like yeah we want change and people be like i've been working for change remember five years back you we had these demands but you didn't sign on yeah. And so it's like, we're going to have to go back and we're going to be like, I'm sorry. You know, like, I mean, it's just like for us to do the kind of work that we need to do to, to make those changes, it's going to be some like restoring relationships, right? It's going to be in that, in that res restoring relationship. This is where even like our allyship, and I'm saying this even for myself, like, I mean, this is the kind of work I've had to do, you know, through the past few years of just like, restoring relationships, re-educating myself around these issues, understanding, you know, and trying to be like, I guess trying to, to understand why the radical solutions, like those are the goals, that's, like, that's what's going to get us free. And, you know, we may have incremental steps, right? So some organizations are reform things, and, but we can't stop. We can't stop at like, okay, we, we want to do this here. You know, and so that's where I think it's when we're trying to address these issues, we have to really understand both the spectrum of social change and respect, you know, like have a little bit more respect for those radical tradition, like radical solutions, because like that's something that, um, you know, like none of the gains, none of the win, like nothing that we have, like, and I don't know if even if there's even a biblical story, the only, I think the only thing that we've gotten as a right in this country, like a day off the Sabbath, that was God given. Like Allah gave that, you know, like here you get the Sabbath, mm -hmm. everything else we have to fight, we have to organize and fight for. Right. You know, so, and that's, the, I'm, I'm totally, you know, I just want to really emphasize the transformational organizing work and that, you know, like as we work towards, you know, as our heart goes out to the families, to the individuals whose lives were cut short, to those who, who are debilitated, you know, whether they've been shot and they're still facing the pain and trauma um, and we're reaching out in solidarity that we also know that there's people right now, the protesters who've right. been injured. We've seen brutality beyond that. And it's very hard for me. Like I've been in conversations with like, hey, like, are you gonna address this? But I'm like, you see what your force have done? Like gassing people for meeting. And so how do we come to terms with that? Like, and what do we push for? It's, you know, like I, I really, I guess well, like I'm a little bit, um, yeah, I mean, we definitely have to get beyond talking and, and the more that we get Muslims behind building power for that systems change, then the more that we could be part of like building a, an amazing future. I think you, you've just proven the point that while the rest of us have been uh, not attentive, uh, to put it diplomatically, uh, mm -hmm. on the real issues that are happening uh, in, in our community, you were there working and 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 doing the heavy lifting and you just articulated uh, all that heavy lifting and i i personally want to um uh, ask for your forgiveness uh for not being there when i should have been there and if there's anything that i could do to make up for that you you, you just let me know thank uh, you and i and i would say like my lifting is nothing on what the people on the streets have been doing. I mean, right. I've joined them sometimes, but there's, there's, we have people who now still are facing charges. We've had people kicked out of school who were on Ferguson, you know, like who just were like, look, we need to do this. And like, because like they couldn't get bail, they lost their, they, they lost their, um, their scholarship and were left homeless. You know, like I've, I've, I know, so many stories of that and so like i feel like what is our obligation to support the organizing work and believe me, i mean most of the people that are doing you know like this work on um you know like believers bailout right you know like some people are like we don't believe it no we need to imagine the future without that we need to imagine a future without jails without police like what do we oh, have yeah. communities like that and it seems so radical but it's like let's take that seriously in our educating 
And also, you know, when we, when we do get pushback, because I get pushback, I'll get calls and they're like, Margie, why'd you say this? Why'd you say that? You need to do this. And I'm like, I, I really try to work on opening up myself to listen to those critiques and to work on restorative work. Right. Like work on restoring my own self in that relationship, but also redressing harm. And, you know, it's the hard work that we, we have to be committed to. And while a lot of, you know, given that we're on this kind of verge of either going like our country going authoritarian, or we can really rebuild to having a more free society where people where justice, we move more towards justice. Like we are, if our community and we can't be afraid of the backlash of those gun-toting militia people, right? Like who are against freedom, who are upholding white supremacy. We can't be afraid of them. We have to really believe that one, that justice is on our side, that we have a beautiful multiracial coalition who are committed towards indigenous rights, black liberation, decolonization, towards making the society more free, you know, like just more free and more just. And right. that's gonna be all of us being part of that and part of the anti-racist movement. Like we gotta lean into Surge, like, hey Surge, you go talk to your folks, just like we're talking to our people as Muslims. Right. And that as we're committed to the work that, you know, and people will benefit, right? And, and what's interesting is with COVID, like you had people that were like totally against social welfare and kind of communism, but, when those checks came in, they're like, thank you. Right. Nobody, nobody is accusing anyone of socialism anymore. Because, yeah. Like you said, what, what's important is our health security, is our economic security, is um, uh, uh, removing uh, racism and having a sense of a semblance of racial equality in our society. That's real security. Mm -hmm. This notion of spending almost a trillion dollars a year for more military more hardware, more surveillance, uh, uh, more uh, of the prison industrial complex. That's, and then, and then people feel insecure. I mean, it's yeah. just obvious, right? But, and then when you show that to them in, in real life situations, like you're talking, uh, they go, oh no, either they say, oh, that's not, you know, that's, you're, 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 a, you're a leftist or you're a socialist or you're kind of, uh, you know, um, conspiratorial. No, this is reality now. And I think what COVID has taught us and uh, the, the George Floyd incident, uh, the murder of George Floyd and, and the protest, it's telling us, it's bringing us back to that reality. Yeah. I, I wanted to uh, give t a, a few uh, minutes left that we have it, to questions from our audience. And Iman, I think we have time for one question. So pick the best one and, and go ahead and then uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, for a very special favor at the end before we we uh, we depart. So uh, go ahead, Ima. Absolutely. Well, I must say that we had questions just coming in like like uh, crazy while you were speaking, Marguerite, um, and you were able to answer most of them. So as I would write them down, I was like, wow, she's just knocking it out of the park. But, you know, I, I think with, with all that you have said, um, one of the big things that, that I think matters um, most right now is this notion of history is repeating itself. History does repeat itself. And, and rather than just being complacent with this notion that, oh, you know, it'll happen again, or oh, what, what can I do as an individual? We must recognize that we have the power to, to cause effective change. Mm -hmm. and, and with that being said, you know, I, I'm looking a lot on social media and, and I see just a flux of tweets and photos and posts um, regarding, you know, the outcry against police brutality and racism lately. Um, but, you know, Snapchat stories, Instagram stories, they last at max 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And tweets, they're sent out by the millions uh, by the hour. I, I know I see my little sister tweeting every five minutes about whatever, you know, you can go through a hundred in, in an hour with her. And, and so I think about, you know, while there's no doubt that social media has an impact, what if you could just share with us for those who are just so desperate to help, who are so excited to help, 
what is something that we can do that will leave more of a lasting impact? Um, aside from just tweeting the picture and hashtagging the, the phrases and things like that. Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's all of this work that's happened. I mean, in most, most cities, you know, there are groups that are working towards addressing this issue. So like the work happens, like organizing for justice happens people to people. So it's like it happens individual to individual and those individuals get in small groups and then we begin to like work to address, the, you know, create solutions and push for change. So, I mean, it will be one, you know, joining an organization really working on that, you know, under learning about racial justice, you know, because this isn't just about one off incidences, right? Like we're talking about a system that, you know, and, and systems are made of people making decisions, but there's also policies, there's institutional culture, you know, there's things like, I mean, California has a lot more progressive laws, you know, but like, how, how did that come about? It came from people organizing, it came through coalition building. So get involved when you have like, organizing groups that um, are working towards change, like follow color of change, um, what NAACP, look at these coalitions that are signing letters, like there's a group of organizations out of Los Angeles that have like, they're actually beautiful demands. I was like, wow, like if LA could pull this off and take that money from the budget and incorporate that, they could reverse so much of the systemic racism, especially against the black Muslim, like the, not the black Muslim, but the black community in general. Mm -hmm. And similar like for San Bernardino County and, you know, like and throughout the country. So it's like, you know, really support black led organizations um, that are doing this kind of work that are working to address, um, you know, what's causing both the over criminalization um, and that are working to, to put forward, you know, levels of accountability to those who are responsible for keeping us safe to investigating the crimes against us, right, you know, so I think there's just tremendous work that's happening locally. From the education and awareness, you know, Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, we are one of, uh, one of the, you know, anti-racism organizations. We also work with Crossroads Anti-Racism Training, which um, they're one of our partners. There's um, People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which is amazing, World Trust. Um, you know, for Muslims, like the one thing like where I would say like, please come to Muslim Arc because many of those institutions don't understand the complex racial dynamics in the Muslim community. And so there's not that level of accountability. Like they may just be like, oh yeah, we're people of color and, and not be able to push towards like how we, you know, like kind of get at that heart work that we need to do that'll bolster us as, as you know, that'll bolster us. And so, you know, I mean, we'll be working with them, you know, like I've worked with Crossroads to, to the, you know, think about frameworks and there's like amazing Muslim organizers and trainers that are pro part of Crossroads. Um, you know, if you're in the South, Project South is deeply committed to anti-racism. Look at these organizations platform because like what they, not just platforms, but the frameworks because they allow us a type of analysis to understand like how we can make strategic change, right? And then how we can envision a more free and just future. Absolutely. I believe it was Audre Lorde who, who wrote a piece that said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so uh, from, from all of us here, you know, we thank you so sincerely for actively <laughs> Oh, no, no, I'm not going to close. I'm not going to close. Because yeah, I, I, I have a special no. announcement or, or right. request uh, for Marguerite before we end. Please, yeah, go ahead. Please. Okay, please. so so Marguerite, um, I'm scheduled to give the chutbah this Friday at the Islamic Center. And what I want to do is, would be uh, a departure from tradition. Uh, and that is uh, to have a Muslim woman speak uh, during the chutbah. Um, and now that we can do things, uh, you, know, you know, virtually, uh, there, there's more latitude uh, from our scholars that we can do uh, things creatively uh, with the chutbah. So I would like to invite you to speak. I'll, I, I'm going to speak maybe for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but I'd like you to take 10 minutes from my chutbah time and speak to the Juma audience, because the Juma audience is the audience that needs the most education. 
They're the ones who attend the mosques every Friday. They're the ones that bring a lot of their cultural traditions and cultural baggage, if you will, and a lot of what we learn from colonialism uh, or infected by colonialism from Muslim majority countries and we brought them to our community. We need somebody to speak uh, to that um, issue. I'll try, but I would like you uh, to to say what you did here, except it's got to be encapsulated in about ten minutes. Ten minutes with within all the Islamic frameworks. I'll try. I'll try my um, best to say. I mean, I haven't checked my schedule. Um, it's usually definitely like a mantle. Like I, I try not to do as much devotional stuff because yeah. it's like it's so it's so heavy. I like I'm like imams like have you know have a heavy weight. Um, so let me, you know, like, even if it's just like, whether it's recorded or a red statement, you know, like I, I, you know, I'll try to do, do my best. Um, this Wednesday, Muslim Mark is having an intro to, it's like learning solidarity. Um, and um, we will talk about our, um, you know, the work that we've done on Black Lives Matter, the work that we've done on the criminalization of Black Muslims, our solidarity framework, and our webinars, and also like our membership. So we'll kind of, within 90 minutes, go into that, but also try to provide a sample of what we do in our workshops. Um, you know, and that's at, so you could go to our website, and it's like muslimark.org front slash. Um, yes. And we put it, we put it on the chat space as well. Yeah, okay, so that's good. Chats. So this one, it's um, building or learning solidarity. So I'm going to okay. share it here. Okay. And so that should work, I think. So I mean, if you could double check that link. Yeah. Um, you know, because we, we are getting a lot of requests and we're trying to like fulfill as many as like we're kind of, we're starting to answer them and look at what our calendar is and and also get um, our other trainers. So we have like Kenyatta Bakir, who is a member of Black Lives Matter. She's on our board. Uh -huh. um, you know, she's been really great. So she's one of, she's a board member and a trainer. Um, you know, we still have Namira Islam and we have uh, Berthina Naba McKinney and we'll be bringing on Imam Mikael out of Detroit, who is Imam Lukman Abdullah's assistant Imam um, you know, so we are building out our roster of trainers and speakers, and we're just really honored to be of service and to, um, you know, to provide um, something to the, both the Muslim community and for, for our allies to understand, you know, the diversity and plurality of American Muslims so that they can also support us in addressing both the intersections of Islamophobia and racism as it impacts all Muslims. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do, Marguerite, and inshallah, um, I look forward to your comments uh, on Friday. I think we're all honored, as uh, somebody just said, Marguerite, I'm honored to listen to you and learn from you. Inshallah, I will commit to educate myself and those in my circles of influence and to support the organizations working for systemic change. Jazakallah khair sending you strength and resolve for your work from Nazil Chaudhry. So thank you, Nazil, for that comment. Thank you. Thank Can you. I send the link now. I don't know if it works. Well, let's see, to all of the attendees, but. Yes. Oh, here it is, I think. Yeah, there it is. There it yeah, is. Slide. Okay, Iman, back to you. Absolutely. And, and all of us here um, at Impact Marguerite, you know, we stand um, in solidarity with, with the work that you do and, and we are actively holding ourselves accountable in, in, in helping shift this, this change, this very necessary change. Um, as we were speaking earlier, you know, Audrey Lord, she, she wrote um, a piece that, that I mentioned before saying that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's home. And I think that when I look at organizations like Muslim ARC, I see 
you crafting your own tools, you advocating for a new system that doesn't just say that A and B are more important, but, but recognizes the importance of the whole alphabet and forging this vocabulary and forging this future that is brighter and safer for us all. So again, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Um, you have always been such a dear friend to unpack and, and we thank you so sincerely for, for joining us today. Um, I encourage all of our viewers to please join um, via the link that Marguerite sent um, on, for, for Muslim Arcs event on, on Wednesday, I believe. Um, I know I will be tuning in. Um, and as always, guys, please visit www.mpac.org forward slash webinars for all upcoming webinars. Um, and again, Marguerite, thank you so much for joining us and to all a good and happy, safe night. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Marguerite. Thank you. Talk again, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.